Goedemiddag allemaal. Goedemiddag allemaal. Goedemiddag. De microfoon doet het. Ja, oké, okay, goed. Um, welkom allemaal. Welkom hier in het uh, auditorium Vesalius. Uh, welkom op uh, de lezing van professor Kip Thorn uh, over gedeelten van de ruimte die vervormd of uh, gedistordeerd zijn. Um, especially a very warm welcome to our uh, distinguished lecturer, Professor Kip Thorne. It's a real honor to have you here today. Uh, I'll continue my opening in, in, in English, uh, mostly for, uh, in courtesy of our uh, guest speaker, of course. Uh, my name is Jan Doge. I'm the Vice Director for Research Policy at the University. Uh, and it's in that function and role that it's my pleasure and honor and privilege to welcome you here this evening at this event. Uh, it's a double honor and double privilege in the sense that in a uh, past uh, history I've also uh, studied physics, so I'll, I also have a background in physics. Um, not so much in the field of expertise of our guest lecturer, uh, but uh, coming from the same uh, discipline and domain. Um, after my master's, I kind of uh, eroded from the pure physics, if you want, and I kind of moved into the medical field, into the medical technology field, uh, biomedical engineering. And I always found that a very exciting and uh, intriguing field, because of course, I still need my physics background. I still need um, wave physics. I work on acoustical imaging, so I work on vibrations, wave equations, I need the mathematics, I go to computational models in order to create synthetic data, synthetic images. Uh, but then, of course, you also want to build something and you don't want to do only computer stuff. So you need to go towards electronics, uh, MEMS devices. Uh, then once you build a system, you need to do signal processing. You need to, once you created images, uh, you need to do uh, image processing, extract features, apply AI to do automated diagnostics, and so on. So it's a really broad scheme of disciplines that is involved in order to move my own field forward. And obviously, I don't cover all of these disciplines, and I'm not an expert in all of these things. I would wish I were. Um, but it shows that I think there is a lot of problems that we need to tackle jointly, uh, collectively, in a multidisciplinary uh, manner. And of course also society has big challenges in front of us. There is a lot of uh, the so-called wicked problems and we'll only be able to try to solve them if we put our heads together. If we go cross-disciplinary, we kind of uh, put minds together and try to solve these problems collectively. And it was with that idea in mind and uh, kind of uh, that spirit that our rector and the rector's team decided a couple of years ago to also raise the so-called K. Leuven Institutes, where we say, okay, uh, surrounding or around a certain number of uh, themes that are societally relevant, we need to bring together sufficient critical mass to be able to move forward. And so in the meantime, we have created about 17 of these uh, institutes focusing on different problems. And I won't uh, enumerate all of them, but we have an institute on AI, on One Health, on cultural heritage, additive manufacturing, uh, many more, 17 of those. All with the idea that it's really the collective and the cross-disciplinary insights that manage to move the field forward. These institutes were not chosen top-down. So there was a framework created within the university and it were really scientists that decided what the themes would be. Um, if we had sufficient scientists coming together and saying this is the theme we want to put forward and collectively work on, then after a certain procedure it could become an institute. And so there is five more of these institutes currently in the making and so we may have a couple of more coming up in the near future. Um, today we will hear about gravitation, gravitational waves, how these waves can be detected, uh, which is of course one of the fields of expertise of the, the guest lecturer. 
And I would dare to say that also in that field, we need to bring together all of uh, different disciplines uh, in order to really move the field forward. Of course, we have a lot of disciplines within physics that we need to address. Um, theoretical physics, particle physics, astrophysics, plasma physics, nuclear physics, uh, you name it. But it goes beyond, it goes to chemistry, it goes to, if we want to build detectors, complex engineering, material sciences, data sciences. Uh, so again, I, I will not be uh, exhausted there, but we need to bring a lot of clever minds together in order to move that field forward. Um, to me, building or working in such a multi multidisciplinary <coughs> manner has not only been needed to move the field forward, but it has also been a lot of fun. It's really interesting to kind of get a different perspective to the same problem from someone with a different training and a different background. And so I would think, although it's not my own skilled expertise, that also the field of gravitational waves uh, should be a lot of fun to work with. Um, finally, uh, I want to say that, as many of you may know, Europe is investing or is planning to invest uh, significantly um, into gravi gravitational waves and gravitational wave detectors. You probably all heard about uh, the plans to build an Einstein uh, telescope, a huge construction, 200 meters underground, uh, tunnels 10, 15 kilometers long, L-shaped, triangular shape uh, still to be discussed, um, very complex engineering involved uh, to try to measure a tiny signal in a lot of background noise, huge challenges ahead, uh, but really an endeavor that can only be successful again if there is a lot of collaborative minds uh, working together. Now, without further ado, I'll uh, pass on the microphone to uh, Professor Thomas Hertog, who is the head of the theoretical physics unit within the Department of uh, Physics here at the university. Uh, I hope you will have a great evening. Uh, you will enjoy the lecture. And uh, most of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Torren to be here with us tonight. Thank you. Letter, okay? no. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the warped side of our universe. It's a great pleasure to uh, introduce our distinguished guest today, uh, Professor Kip Thorne, the Feynman Emeritus Professor of Theoretical Physics at Caltech, laureate of the 2017 uh, Nobel Prize in Physics, laureate of the Georges Lemaitre Prize of our sister university, UC Louvain, and maybe more familiar to some of you, Christopher Nolan's science advisor for Interstellar. <laughs> Kip, welcome to Leuven. What I admire about uh, Kip's is the broad span of his research career. Kip started out as a theoretical physicist in the late 1960s. He's a relativist as we say in physics, specialized in Einstein's theory of general relativity. In those days, he wrote what we know in our field as the phone book. But for those of you who don't know what a phone book looks like, <laughs> I brought along my copy. <laughs> this is Gravitation by Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler. And it's the heaviest textbook ever. Uh, in our field, and it lifted Einstein's theory out of the realm of mathematics where it had got stuck. Their book made the scientific community realize in the early 70s that Einstein's theory is important to understand our real universe, and Kip became a world expert in the astrophysical implications of Einstein's theory, especially when it comes to black holes and, and gravitational waves. Now, I first met Kip, I think, in 99, uh, when Stephen Hawking took me along on a research visit to Caltech. Hawking and Thorne had been close friends for many years, and there in Los Angeles, Kip gave us a taste 
of what life is like in Hollywood, something which served me well later in life. <laughs> but he also took us to um, what seemed like an obscure physics lab on the Caltech campus where, far from the spotlights, painstaking experiments were being conducted with lasers, with mirrors hanging from complicated pendulums and a thousand other things. Well, that lab turned out to be a key test facility for uh, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, which Kip had co-founded in 1984 to try to test some of the astrophysical implications of Einstein's theory. Years later, LIGO was brought to a spectacular success, as we all know, with the first direct observations of gravitational waves in September 2015, for which Kip shared the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics with Ray Wise and Barry Barish, two of the key players on their experimental team. Now, looking back, I realize my brief visit to Kip's obscure lab in 1999 taught me, in fact, a few important lessons. First, excellent science can be done far from the spotlights. It's okay not to tweet about your work for 30 years if that's what it takes. And these days in physics, it is often what it takes. Second, and this is one for our students, at some point, I think you should leave Leuven behind. There's a lot to discover out there. And eventually, this pays off. If I hadn't gone to Cambridge, and if Hawking hadn't introduced me to Kip, I probably wouldn't have been able to put cosmology and gravitational wave science on the map in Belgium 20 years later. And we wouldn't be where we are today. Third, LIGO succeeded not only because Kip and his team tackled the enormous technical challenges, but also because they brought together multiple academic institutions and policy bodies in some sort of ecosystem in which long-term, innovative, blue-sky scientific research could thrive. And that is quite a feat. So the broad span of Kip's research career, from theory to experiment, is exceptional and admirable. But as we all know, we didn't stop there. Many of you may know Kip from yet another angle. Indeed, more recently, Kip transitioned from physics to collaborations between science and arts. And we'll hear more from him tomorrow in the context of the world premiere at Dockville of Paula Frohle's movie, Far Away, Nearby. And Paula, welcome here in Leuven. So without further ado, let me give you our guest himself. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a most distinguished colleague, the Galileo of our era, Kip Thorne. There you go. Thank you. A quotation from my dear friend Stephen Hawking. Can you hear me? <laughs> That's the way he always talked, started his lectures through his whole career. And, and we were close friends from the very beginning of his career. And I quite miss him. Um, so I want to tell you today about the warped side of our universe. And then my story begins 62 years ago in 1962 when I went to Princeton University to study uh, for a PhD, to study as a graduate student, we call them in the US, uh, under John Archibald Wheeler. Wheeler at that point was the great guru of relativity, the great mentor of uh, young scientists uh, and inspirer, inspiring us all about black holes and wormholes and other things on what I nowadays like to call the warped side of our universe. He told us that there really ought to be, very probably are, objects and phenomena in the universe that are made from warped space and time. And that's what I call the warped side of our universe. Uh, the examples which he was already talking about at that time were black holes, gravitational waves, 
the Big Bang singularity in which our universe was born, wormholes, and possibly backward time travel. And so what I want to do today is tell you what we have learned in these past 62 years, beginning from an era when we had really almost no observational evidence for these things, except the, the Big Bang, uh, and uh, just hints that these other things might exist until the present era when some of this is very, very solid and others still is a little shaky. So let me just tell you the whole story uh, from that time, or a portion of the whole story. So let me begin with black holes. A black hole such as this one is made from warped space and warp time. For example, the circumference around this black hole is much smaller than the, the diameter. Although it doesn't look like it, it doesn't look like it because we're so accustomed to thinking about how things are in a universe that has a flat geometry, uh, like the geometry of a flat sheet of paper. And if a black hole is drawn on a flat sheet of paper, obviously the circumference cannot be smaller than the diameter. But imagine a child's trampoline, a rubber sheet that is put up on very tall stilts, sticks, and place a rock at the center, a very dense, heavy rock at the center, so it bends the rubber down in this manner. And then imagine that you are an ant. You're a blind ant, so you can't see what the universe looks like, but you uh, can measure the geometry of your universe. So you go marching around and around uh, here, and you measure the circumference, and then you go to measure the diameter, and the diameter obviously is huge compared to the uh, circumference. And so you conclude you live in a universe that has a warped geometry. Now, the very same diagram can be used to describe a black hole. If I take a black hole and I take an equatorial slice through it, so I now have a two-dimensional surface, that geometry is warped. Uh, and I can visualize the geometry by embedding that two-dimensional slice in a higher dimensional flat space in such a manner that the geometry of that slice is the same as this surface that I draw in the higher dimensional flat space. We physicists call this higher dimensional flat space the bulk. Uh, and so this is not part of our universe. It's an external higher dimensional universe in which the black hole and our universe live. And again, the diameter is very large compared to the circumference for the same reason as in my analogy uh, with the child's trampoline. In place of the rock, there is a singularity down here, a region where, as in the Big Bang singularity, where the laws of physics as we know them fail and get replaced because you have extreme curvature, extreme warping down here. They have to get replaced by a new set of physical laws that are called the laws of quantum gravity, which is something uh, that Thomas Hertog uh, knows a lot about, has contributed majorly to. Now, so let's suppose that I am uh, falling into a black hole and I'm transmitting microwave signals back to you. This is just a little two-dimensional kip, uh, two-dimensional person, two-dimensional me, uh, because I've suppressed the third dimension of our real physical universe. And so I'm moving down on the surface uh, of uh, this funnel. And when I go through what we call the horizon, below there, gravity is so strong that not only am I pulled down inexorably the singularity, but so is, are the microwave signals, and I, there's no way for me to possibly get out. Another way to see there's no way to get out is by looking at the warping of time around the black hole. So in addition to this warping of space, time as I move down very close to the horizon and hover there, it slows to a halt right at the horizon. And relative to time back here on Earth, it doesn't flow at all. It's flowing exceedingly slowly. And below the horizon, time is flowing in a direction you would have thought was a space direction toward the singularity, and that's one re another reason that nothing can uh, get out of the black hole. Nothing can move backward, backward against the local flow of time. Now, when I talk at the very end a little bit about possibility of backward time travel, it's not backward time travel against the local flow of time. It's backward time travel that might be achievable by going out in space 
and returning before you left, but you're nowhere ever moving against the local flow of time. That is absolutely impossible. Now, there's a third aspect besides of, uh, the warping of space and time around a black hole, besides warping of space and warping of time, and that is uh, there is a whirling motion of space like the air in a tornado. The black hole spins and it drags space into a whirling motion. This is sometimes called the dragging of inertial frames because it really is inertia that feels this, uh, this whirling motion of space. So that if you're very near the uh, horizon, uh, there's, it's impossible for you to avoid whirling around and around relative to the distant stars. It's the actual motion, basically, of inertial reference frames or motion of space, I like to say, uh, that is going on here. Uh, high angular velocity near the horizon, much slower, farther away, as indicated by these arrows. Now, here is an actual precise description. It's a map, if you wish of the warped space time around a rapidly spinning black hole. And so down here at the bottom is the horizon. It's a circle. When you restore the third spatial dimension that I've removed, that circle becomes a flattened sphere. So the horizon actually is a flattened sphere, but it just shows a circle here. Uh, the color coding shows the slowing of time. Where it is yellow, time is flowing at 10% the rate that it is back on Earth. Uh, and the arrows show the actual angular velocity of the whirling of space, large near the horizon and much slower farther on away. Now, there's a big question then. What is it that produces the black holes, uh, that warps the black hole space and time? And the answer is, it is the energy contained in the warping itself. In other words, the black hole is held together by what we physicists or engineers would call a nonlinear self-interaction. It's a so-called gravitational soliton. If you were to take a uh, bow and arrow and you pull the arrow back with uh, the bow, uh, you put a lot of energy into bending the bow. And that energy is going into warping the bow and warping the string that uh, you've uh, pulled the arrow back on. Uh, and uh, in the same way, the warping of space and time here entails a huge amount of energy that has been put in there. And that energy is the thing that produces and maintains the warping. It's a self-fulfilling or self-replicating, self-sustaining phenomenon, and really quite remarkable. Now, if I have placed my wife up here at the North Pole of the Black Hole, as uh, Carol Lee, much my wife, as uh, she gives me permission to do. Uh, and uh, then if uh, she, uh, her feet are closer to the black hole than her head, and so uh, the uh, space down here is going around with a higher angular velocity than up at her head. Her head looks down at her feet then and sees her feet going around counterclockwise relative to her head. And if you think about it, her feet, looking up at her head, see her head going around counterclockwise. You actually, there's a very familiar thing of this sort. If you take a wet towel and you wring the water out of the towel, if your right hand sees your left hand going counterclockwise, then your left hand will see the right hand going counterclockwise. And so there's a counterclockwise twist of the towel. Or there can be a clockwise twist of the towel. And so you have a vortex, I like to call it, a vortex of twisting space counterclockwise at the north pole of the black hole and the south pole of the black hole, there is a clock corresponding clockwise vortex of twisting space. So spinning black holes, quiescent just black holes just sitting there spinning, they have sticking out of them two vortices, clockwise and counterclockwise, produced by the spin of the black hole. And that's quite remarkable. They actually have physical structure sticking out of them that's made from warp space. And, uh, and there are additional physical structures sticking out called tendencies. These are things that stretch and squeeze anything that gets very close to the black hole. And so there is really a rich structure around a black hole that is, uh, that we can see in computer simulations that we visualize in computer simulations, but a structure that involves vortices of twisting space, clockwise and counterclockwise, tendencies of two sorts, similarly two sorts, 
that stretch and squeeze. I will return to this just a little bit later on, but uh, I will not say very much more about this, although it's a very interesting, and we're learning a lot about this from computer simulations. Now, black holes in our universe today, we know that there are roughly 10 million black holes in the Milky Way galaxy, and 10 to the 18, that is a billion billion black holes in the universe as a whole, out to the edge of the observable universe. The masses range from about three times the mass of the sun up to about 20 billion times the mass of the sun. And the diameters, uh, what I, I really should have said the circumference, because the diameters, I, I said, are, are abnormally big. So the circumference is divided by two, circumference is divided by uh, pi, uh, uh, which I will call the diameter, as, as though space were flat. These range from about 10 kilometers to about 100 billion kilometers, and are there approximately uh, proportional to the masses of the black holes. So uh, it's quite remarkable that a three solar mass black hole has the size of about 10 kilometers. Now, the iconic image of a black hole for a number of years after the movie Interstellar came out was this, although this image, this kind of an image, was first seen, I think, uh, in uh, theoretical calculations by Jean-Pierre Luminet uh, in Paris many, many years ago. But uh, we also saw it in, from computer simulations again, uh, the black hole Gargantua in the movie Interstellar. And uh, why does it look like this? Well, you're looking here at the shadow of a black hole with something going, a crossbar going in front. And this is produced by a, a disk of very hot gas that's called an accretion disk around the black hole. And if I have a IMAX camera, as in the movie Interstellar, up here sitting just above the uh, equatorial plane of the black hole where the accretion disk is, then a light beam coming up off the back face, upper back face of the disk will go up and around and be bent down by the black hole's gravity in warped space and time. It's bent down and comes down to the camera from above, and so that produces the upper branch of this image. And similarly, a light beam from the bottom back face of the disk comes up from below to the camera, producing the bottom piece of the image, and this crossbar is caused by light coming from the front of the disk. So it's very, very simple. Uh, what gives rise to that. Uh, now, in the recent years, something called the Event Horizon Telescope has actually made direct astronomical images of black holes. Uh, this Event Horizon Telescope combines the data from many radio telescopes, actually millimeter wave telescopes, operating of 1.3 millimeter wavelength uh, light, uh, that uh, are at various locations around uh, the Earth, from Hawaii, North America, South America, Antarctica, Greenland, uh, Africa, and Europe. Uh, and they're like a gigantic telescope. The uh, signals, uh, from the millimeter signals from those, these uh, radio telescopes are combined coherently, is the technical word, to produce an image that is the image that you would have seen if you had a telescope that's actually the size of the Earth. And it's really quite remarkable then that with this enormous resolution that has achieved, the 400 scientists and engineers in this collaboration led by Shep Doleman at Harvard Smithsonian uh, in, uh, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, that has had success initially in spring of 2019 at observing the black hole in the M87 galaxy. And this is what that black hole looked like. Here's the shadow. Uh, here's the ring around it, but you don't see any crossbar. So what went wrong with the, the movie Interstellar? <laughs> well, suppose we take the uh, camera in uh, the movie Interstellar and move that IMAX camera from the equatorial plane up to the north pole of the black hole. Uh, then what happens? Uh, well, it's obvious. Uh, as seen from the North Pole, you lose the crossbar, and then you fuzz it out uh, because of the poor resolution of the uh, Event Horizon Telescope. 
But then something happens that's not, also not in the image in Interstellar. It's much brighter on one side than the other. Now, I knew that would be the case because the gas is moving towards us on this side of the black hole and away from us on that side. So there's a Doppler shift that makes the light uh, much brighter on this side and uh, less red than on that side. And uh, I said to Christopher Nolan when we were working on this movie, you re we really need to show this, that it's brighter on one side than on the other side. He said, no, uh, that's not the way the human eye will see it. When you have a really bright source of light, you can't distinguish bright bright from just merely bright. You, the human eye can't really make the distinction, nor can it uh, tell colors very well. And he said, I want this to look in the movie like it would look to the human eye. And so we gave up the Doppler shifts. Uh, <laughs> now this is also a bit of a cheat that in that the gas flow around the black hole in the galaxy M87, which has been imaged, uh, is not in a thin disk. And so it's a more complicated gas flow, but nevertheless the image, aside from the Doppler shift which is present, looks the, uh, the same as would uh, the image uh, in interstellar if we brought the camera up to the North Pole. Let me move on and talk about gravitational waves. Gravitational waves were predicted by Albert Einstein in uh, 1916, a few months after he formulated his laws of general relativity that govern the uh, behavior of warp space and warp time and how warp space and time affect other things in the universe. But these uh, laws then, he predicted that gravitational wave, if it is traveling from you to me, it will stretch me uh, transverse to the direction of propagation, stretch me in this direction, then squeeze me in that direction, and then at the next half cycle of the wave, stretch in this direction and squeeze in that direction. So it's stretching and squeezing as shown here. This is what it would look like if you were to lay out a bunch of particles in interplanetary space, and each particle is moving inertially. There are no forces acting on it at all. There's only the gravitational wave that's going by. The gravitational wave is stretching and squeezing space in which these uh, particles are riding uh, inertially, stretching and squeezing space. So the inertial frame here and there in which each particle ri rides, one over here and one over there, the inertial frames are moving back and forth respect to each other. And that's what I mean by stretching and squeezing of space. Now, uh, there are only two types of waves as we understand it. Uh, from the laws of physics uh, that uh, can be created far away in the universe and they can travel to Earth bringing us information about what's going on in the distant universe. Electromagnetic waves, which includes of course light, radio waves, x-rays, gamma rays, and gravitational waves. Uh, and it was Galileo about 400 years ago who built a small optical telescope and pointed it at, at, at Jupiter discovered Jupiter's four largest moons and thereby initiated instrument-based electromagnetic astronomy. And we have, through uh, uh, optical instruments, then radio wave instruments, X-ray, gamma ray instruments, we have learned an enormous amount about the universe. There's been a veritable revolution in our understanding of the universe through this in instrumentation that was begun by Galileo. Our goal with gravitational waves, uh, when I began to work in this uh, field uh, with colleagues, was to do for gravitational waves what Galileo did 400 years ago uh, for electromagnetic waves. We would build a gravitational wave detect detection system, uh, explore something, and it was fairly early on that it seemed pretty clear to me what we would be exploring or seeing would be collisions of black holes and through observing these black hole collisions, uh, initiate instrument-based gravitational wave astronomy. And it was my expectation, it is my expectation, that over the coming decades and centuries, uh, gravitational waves, together with electromagnetic waves, will revolutionize our understanding of the universe, just as electromagnetic waves have since the time of Galileo. And so there's a very exciting vision that motivated my colleagues and me when we began to think about this actually in 1972, basically. I mean, I had begun working on 
foundations for some of this in the 60s, but it was 1972 that Bill Press, a student of mine and I, published our first uh, long paper describing a vision for this. Now, gravitational waves are made from the same thing as black holes. They're made from warped space-time. Uh, stretching and squeezing of space as time passes. And so they, in fact, are the ideal tool for exploring the warped side of the universe, for exploring black holes, the Big Bang singularity, uh, things that are made from warped space-time. Uh, black holes and other objects on the warped side of the universe they cannot produce electromagnetic waves. You have to have electrical charge present. If there's gas, hot gas, going around a black hole, well then you get electromagnetic waves and you can image the shadow of a black hole that way, and that's what has been done by my colleagues in the Event Horizon Telescope. But if you want to study the black hole itself directly, the tool for doing that is the kind of wave that the black holes themselves do emit without the aid of any electric charges, uh, gravitational waves. It was Joseph Weber in 1957 who initiated the first effort to detect gravitational waves. And Paula Froley, who's here and is going to be presenting uh, her uh, film about Joseph Weber and his work, which was a foundation from which we took off in LIGO, and, uh, I, she describes beautifully in this film to be shown at Dockville tomorrow, uh, how emotion played a big role in driving Joe Weber and also how emotion got in the way of his work to some degree. And this whole issue of the relationship of emotion to science, I think is a tremendously interesting uh, uh, issue. And it is one that uh, she beautifully uh, explores in this film. Joe Weber built the first gravitational wave detector, a very different kind of detector from the one that, uh, that uh, we have used and ultimately had success on. I won't go into detail about it, except to say that this type of gravitational wave detector continued to be built by other experimental groups uh, for another 40 years after he invented this, time, this type. But the type that ultimately had success was a rather different design of the detector that was due to Ray Weiss at MIT and he, in 1972, uh, he wrote a technical paper describing this particular approach, uh, simultaneous with Bill Press and me writing the first uh, paper on a vision for what you would do with gravitational wave astronomy if you could detect gravitational waves. And what his detector uh, was is the following. You have four mirrors that hang from overhead supports. You're looking down on the mirrors from above. And so uh, these are the mirrors seen in profile. Uh, you have a laser, you have a beam splitter that splits a, a light beam in two. The, uh, and these mirrors, they hang uh, like pendula and so they can swing in response to a gravitational wave. If the gravitational wave has a frequency high compared to the one hertz, one cycle per second swinging of, of the pendula. And then it's just as though they, the mirrors were hanging free, were uh, free mirrors in space. The restoring force of the pendulum doesn't have much effect at all. And so the laser beam comes in, it's split in two, and it is sent through a hole in this mirror. It bounces back and forth a number of times, typically about a hundred times, and then comes back. And uh, the other half of the beam, right after it's split, goes in, bounces back and forth a hundred times, then comes back. The two beams interfere at the beam splitter, and uh, part of the light goes back toward the laser, and part of it goes toward a photo detector here. Now what happens is when the gravitational wave stretches space on this arm and squeezes it on that arm, then the distance that the light beam travels in this arm gets larger than the distance in that arm, and as a result, the interference has changed and the intensity of the light going to, toward the photodetector rises and then falls as you get stretched and squeezed and stretched and squeezed. So you get an intensity of the light beam that, at the output that rises and falls in uh, proportion to directly mirroring the stretch and squeeze of the gravitational wave. A very clever idea because Interferometry, this technique of interfering the light in the two arms, is capable of unbelievably high precision. But I looked at this 
when I, uh, when Ray Weiss sent me his technical paper on this, uh, and uh, I looked at it and I thought about it, it just seemed to me that he'd gone crazy. <laughs> because uh, the amount of stretch and squeeze that you were going to have from the strongest source I could imagine, which was two black holes colliding, uh, it was going to be so small that he didn't have a prayer of success. And so uh, I was uh, in the final stages of finalizing this book uh, with uh, jo John Wheeler and Charlie Misner called Gravitation that, uh, uh, that you showed the audience today, the telephone book. Uh, it was going to press in a matter of weeks uh, after that. And so I simply put in a one paragraph describing that book, the idea, and I wrote, this is not very promising. And there's sort of an exercise to explain why it's not very promising. Uh, the secret is, of course, I spent the rest of my career eating crow, as they say. Uh, uh, I, so as I will explain, okay. So why did I think it was not very promising? Let's take one centimeter, uh, divide it by 100, you get the thickness of a human hair, 100 microns. Divide by 100 again, you get the wavelength of the light that is used for this purpose in uh, Ray Weiss's interferometers. Divide by 10,000, you get the diameter of an atom, the atoms of which the mirrors are made, the mirrors off which the light is bouncing. Divide by 100,000, you get the diameter of an atomic nucleus inside the atom. Divide by 100 and you get about the magnitude of the signal that I would expect if the mirror's distance separation here is four kilometers, which is what we wound up using in LIGO. This means this, that the mirror motions we wanted, that Ray uh, claims he's going to be able to measure were 10 million times smaller than the individual atoms of which the mirrors were made. And he was telling us he could bounce light off of these mirrors uh, and uh, use this interferometry technique to monitor motions 10 million times smaller than the individual atoms. It just seemed crazy to me. Until I talked with him a number of times about it uh, and talked with other colleagues, experimental colleagues, and thought through and did a, lot, a bunch of calculations of my own and finally, I became convinced that with a major effort, there was a reasonable probability of success. And so at that point, I decided that here, this was a high risk, but very high payoff uh, enterprise. And that it was well worth the risk. And that I would do all that I and my students could possibly do as theorists. I'm a theorist, I'm not an experimenter, though Ray will uh, stroke me uh, a little bit and praise me in public saying, I earned my experimental, uh, 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 my right to call myself an experimenter by my contributions, but no, really, I'm a theorist. But we theorists would do all we possibly could do to help him and his experimental colleagues succeed. Now, Ron Drieber, who at the time was at the University of Glasgow, uh, an experimental physicist there, he, uh, invented several major improvements on Ray Weiss's idea. Uh, perhaps the most important one was that uh, instead of having mirrors that you would send a light beam through a hole in the mirror and then bounce it back and forth a hundred times, uh, you have all of those hundred bounces sit on top of each other by making uh, the, these two mirrors form what is called a Fabry-Perot cavity. It's just a cavity in which light uh, resonates in here. Uh, it goes down, it comes back, and when it's reflected, it uh, is reflected in phase with the original light. And so it just goes back and forth in phase with itself. And in that case, when the light comes in, it gets sucked into these arms, it bounces back and forth a hundred times, and then it uh, uh, leaks back out through the uh, beam splitter and goes to the photodetector, and it all works just as in Ray's original idea. But that's made the design much more compact and more versatile, it turned out. But it was a lot harder to do experimentally. And to really pull it off and make the light interfere, the beam splitter, 
took several decades of experimental effort. So this is fundamentally why Ray uh, was skeptical from the beginning that uh, this technique would really work. But it did turn out it worked, and given that it worked, it really had a lot of advantages. So we imported uh, Ron Drieber to Caltech in 1979 to lead an effort, uh, an experimental effort, hand in hand with my theory group, uh, to uh, work in collaboration with Ray Weiss at MIT. Uh, and thus began then a 40-year effort of intense work uh, from about 1975, roughly, when uh, Ron started building interferometers himself three years after Ray started, uh, until we ultimately had success. Those 40 years of intense work involved then experimental work, R&D work, uh, plus development of data analysis techniques by groups at MIT, Glasgow, Caltech, the Max Planck Institutes, uh, in University of Hanover, groups in Italy and France, Japan, Australia, Russia. Uh, there were major contributions from all of these different research groups. Uh, there were computer simulations of sources, particularly of colliding black holes, which I was expecting to be the strongest source, because we can't solve Einstein's equations with pencil and paper and figure out the details of the gravitational waves that come from colliding black holes. It was necessary to solve the Einstein's equations on uh, supercomputers uh, in order to compute the uh, details of the collisions in the emitted gravitational waves. Uh, the uh, LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory then, uh, was formulated, uh, founded by Drever and me and Ray Weiss. It was led by Robbie Volk, the uh, great experimenter at Caltech for a few years. Then Barry Barish took over, and Barry was really the person who made it succeed. He built this up into a team of 1,000 scientists and engineers at 80 institutions in 14 nations in a multidisciplinary effort, as uh, you were describing at the beginning, a true multidisciplinary effort, effort with contributions coming from many different areas of science, uh, technology, engineering, in order to pull this off, because it was very difficult. As I said uh, earlier, I thought it was so hard that you could, couldn't succeed for a while. And we decided, made the proposal to build then LIGO in 1989 to the U.S. National Science Foundation. But we said from the outset, we'll build a first generation of four kilometer scale instruments that will probably not be sensitive enough to see anything. And then we will take the knowledge that we gain by uh, working with these initial simple uh, gravity wave interferometers. Uh, to do the design of a more advanced generation of instruments, and then those are the ones that will ha ultimately have success. And that is a tribute to the National Science Foundation and to the American Congress that they bought into this vision and this plan, and they didn't uh, uh, back off at all when we saw nothing with the first generation and move smoothly, in fact, into the second generation. There was no hiccup in the, in the funding from Congress. Uh, and when we ultimately succeeded in 2015, the US Congress, both Republicans and Democrats, took great pride in having uh, backed this project uh, over all of these many, many years, uh, which really paid off in a huge sort of a way, uh, but with high risk, uh, a big investment, 1.1 billion US dollars by the time we were finished. But it, the, pay, the investment paid off. And as I say, uh, it's, a good, it's a real example, uh, a beautiful example of collaboration between policymakers and uh, funding agencies uh, and scientists and engineers. So 1.3 billion years ago, there were two black holes 1.3 billion light years away from Earth. Two black holes going around and around each other. Each black hole is seen from the bulk, from the higher dimensions, looks like a funnel, like I showed you before. The color coding is showing the slowing of time near the uh, black hole horizon. Where it's black, it's inside the horizon. And uh, the collision produced a huge splash, like in a, a storm in the ocean, and then an oscillation and, as the, uh, and that big splash and oscillation produced gravitational waves 
when traveling out into the universe. That splash, in fact, I like to call a storm, a brief storm, but a, a really huge storm in the fabric or geometry of space and time. John Wheeler, my PhD mentor, called this geometrodynamics. And he was thinking about, he and his students were thinking about black hole collisions already in the 1950s. Except they thought they were colliding wormholes with each other and they were mistaken, they were colliding black holes with each other. That's, that's another complicated and very interesting story that I, I won't go into. Uh, and so, uh, but this storm then was a geometrodynamic storm that produced gravitational waves that traveled out of the uh, galaxy in which the black holes live into intergalactic space, across the great reaches of intergalactic space. And 50,000 years ago, when our ancestors were sharing the Earth with the Neanderthals, this burst of gravitational waves reached the outer edges of our Milky Way galaxy. And for 50,000 years, that 50,000 years of human evolution, uh, they traveled into and through the Milky Way galaxy, arriving at Earth and touching down first at the Antarctic Peninsula, three days before LIGO's advanced detectors, the second generation, were scheduled to start their first gravity wave search. Now fortunately, those instruments were tuned up. We needed three more days of tuning the instruments. They're very complex instruments, but they were very close to where the team wanted uh, the instruments to be. And so they were ready and waiting. This signal came in uh, and uh, the uh, signal went up through the Earth it arrived at our LIGO gravity wave detector in Livingston, Louisiana, uh, and seven milliseconds later, it arrived at the gravity wave detector in Hanford, Washington. The first one is near New Orleans. The second one is near Seattle, Washington. Uh, and uh, the fact that it arrived in New Orleans first and in, in, uh, in uh, uh, near Seattle, Washington later, Seattle is sort of northwest of, uh, of New Orleans, told us that the, the signal source was down in the southern hemisphere. And so we got triangulated by the time delay and uh, triangulated on, on the source by the time delay and arrival of the signal. For five months, our 1,000 person team, but it was actually 1,000 people in LIGO and the Virgo collaboration the Virgo, collabora Virgo collaboration was a group that had built a gravity wave detector very similar to this, three kilometer long arms near Pisa, Italy. It was a French, uh, Italian, and then joined by uh, the Netherlands, and later Poland and Hungary, and now Spain and a number of other countries, a collaboration. But their detector was not yet running. It, it was running, it was taking two years longer than LIGO to get operational. So we analyzed the data jointly between the Virgo collaboration and the LIGO collaboration. Uh, and these are photos of some of the people that did this. It took five months to become convinced that this was a real signal. We wanted to be absolutely sure it was a real, a real gravity wave signal and not something else. And uh, then the result was announced. And, uh, and what we saw, figured out was by comparing the waveform, here I'm stretching and squeezing as a function of time. Up is stretch on one of the arms and down is squeezing as a function of time running along here. Uh, you can think of the gray as the cleaned up signal and the red is a computer simulation, uh, the waveform of computer simulation with the masses and spins of these black holes adjusted in order to get a, a essentially perfect match with the observed incoming signal. And by doing that tuning of the masses and spins, uh, primarily the masses, of, uh, to get a good match, we were able to conclude, or the LIGO-Virgo team of data analysts was able to conclude that the initial black holes were 29 and 36 solar masses for a total of 65 solar masses. Uh, and uh, the final black hole was 62 solar masses. So it was as though you had taken three suns 
annihilated them and turned all of their mass into gravitational wave energy and sent it out in a gravitational wave burst across the universe. 1.3 billion light years. We concluded the distance of three solar masses went into gravitational waves and the distance was 1.3 billion light years from just the details of the signal. So that was really impressive. And uh, what was also impressive, let me say this here, was that the, uh, was that the total luminosity in gravitational waves, the energy per unit time that was arriving at Earth during that fraction of a second that the signal was uh, coming in, corresponding to the epoch when the two black holes were colliding, the total luminosity was 50 times higher than the luminosity of all the stars in the universe put together. 50 universe luminosities in one burst of gravitational waves from two colliding black holes, just incredible. Uh, so it gives you some sense of the power of gravity. Uh, we announced the result uh, on February 10th of 2016, the next day, uh, it made front page uh, headlines and essentially all the newspapers around the world. Two years later, on August 17, 2017, the Virgo gravity wave detector was now operating. And we had a signal come in that turned out to be due to the collision of two neutron stars rather than two black holes. And it was, uh, we were able to triangulate on the source and see with rather good accuracy where it was on the sky because we had three detectors and so we could determine the direction in two dimensions on, on the sky. Uh, each neutron star was about 30 kilometers in diameter uh, and uh, weighed about one and a half times the mass of the sun. Uh, and as these two neutron stars went around each other, they emitted gravitational waves. The gravitational waves caused the stars to spiral together as they carried away energy. And as the stars collided and merged, they created a fireball of electromagnetic emission that included emission in every frequency band that astronomers are capable of operating in, from the extreme radio wave band to uh, the high energy gamma ray end. Uh, the gravitational waveform looked like that. You see many, many cycles of the in-spiral and then the collision uh, here. And the uh, 1.7 seconds after the collision occurred, according to the gravitational waves, a gamma ray burst arrived. Here is the uh, location of the gravity waves source on the sky, and that's the location of the gamma ray burst source on the sky. So the two error boxes overlapped quite nicely. And then over the period of the following few hours, uh, X-rays, ultraviolet, optical, infrared, and radio waves all came in. This was the most observationally studied uh, event in the history of astronomy, with something like a quarter of the world's uh, astronomers studying it with one form or another of electromagnetic waves. And from the observations, we learned an enormous amount I think this is called multi-messenger astronomy nowadays. The messengers are gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves, and a huge, the full range of electromagnetic waves. And we were able to deduce, they, the uh, data analysts uh, uh, were able to deduce from combined uh, electromagnetic and gravitational wave uh, data that a large fraction of all the gold and platinum in the universe was produced by these kinds of neutron star collisions. So it was uh, really wonderful to see this uh, happen, uh, again, two years after the first gravitational wave signal from colliding black holes. We, by now, uh, in uh, early 2024, have seen several collisions of neutron stars, but only one that was close enough that we could see the electromagnetic emission. The gravitational wave emission can be seen to much greater distances than, than the electromagnetic because there's much more power in the gravitational waves. Uh, so we're waiting eagerly for another neutron star collision that is nearby. Several black holes swallowing neutron stars have been seen, uh, and about 140 black hole collisions have now been seen. And from the data from those 140 black hole collisions, uh, the uh, gravitational wave astronomers have been exploring the laws that govern uh, black holes, 
the properties of the black holes in our universe and the populations of black holes in our universe. We've been learning a huge amount. I'm going to just give you one uh, bit of information about the kinds of things that we are learning. Uh, the key thing is that we are now exploring the warp side of our universe with gravitational waves, which was the vision that started my colleagues and I on this uh, uh, great path in 1972. Uh, so uh, let me remind you that when the two black holes collide, you have this uh, geometrodynamical storm uh, that is really very interesting. And it's very rich if I can tell you that the, the one example of the richness is that each black hole has two vortices of twisting space. But when the black holes merge, the uh, merged black hole has four vortices, uh, two from each original black hole. A black hole doesn't want to have four vortices, it only wants to have two when it settles down in the equilibrium. So the vortices sort of fight with each other and struggle and embrace each other and go flying off in embraced pairs, clockwise and counterclockwise. Uh, and uh, and the, those outflying uh, vortices, as they move, they create tendencies of stretching and squeezing space and become gravitational waves. And there's a great richness in the dynamics of what's going on in here. Uh, but I thought that we would have a very complicated waveform when the black hole collision occurred, but it's really very simple. And I thought very complicated before we had computer simulations. And computer simulations came in the maturation of the computer simulation effort, which also took about 50 years to mature. Uh, it uh, uh, matured just about two years before the uh, first gravity wave signal came in. And it showed these very simple waveforms. And the question is, why? And the answer is that, uh, the, uh, that the really interesting gravitational waves from the storm all go down the merged black hole. And the waves that manage to get out are coming from outside this little circle. Outside this circle, uh, even when the black hole collision occurs, the space-time geometry looks like that of the final spinning black hole. And so the waves that we see from the collision onward, the collision is up here onward, those waves, in fact, are what we call normal modes of vibration of the final black hole. They're like the tones of a bell if you hit it with a hammer. You can get several different tones. Well, we see in the computer simulations two normal modes, two tones of ringing of the final black hole. Uh, and by uh, combining then very uh, high accuracy computer simulations with the observations, uh, it is possible then to uh, determine the frequency, well, from the observations, you can determine the frequency and the decay rate of both normal modes. And then we can infer from that, those frequency and decay rates, that's four numbers. Two of those numbers, the best measure of those two numbers, uh, tell us the mass and the spin of the final black hole. And there is a so-called theorem, uh, well, a theorem in general relativity that says once the, the final black hole, its mass and spin determine all of the black hole's properties. And so if we've determined the mass and the spin from two of these four numbers, then the other two numbers had better come out to agree with the predictions of general relativity that they're determined also just by the mass and the spin. And there is a test then of the so-called black hole uniqueness that has been done, uh, verifying at a reasonably interesting accuracy that uh, those are uh, in accord with the so-called black hole uniqueness. There's also a testing of, of Stephen Hawking's laws of black hole dynamics, particularly his second law of black hole dynamics, which says that the surface area of the final black hole, of its horizon, should be bigger than the sum of the surface areas of the uh, two initial black holes. So this uh, surface area of a black hole is really its entropy in disguise. And this is the law, second law of thermodynamics in disguise. And in fact, then, to 97% accuracy, this has been verified from a very careful combination of computer simulations and observations on that first uh, black hole collision. And so it's really quite impressive what can be done by the combination of uh, computer simulations uh, solving Einstein's equations on a computer 
with uh, the uh, observations. Now, when we first turned on in our first data run uh, with LIGO, uh, we were seeing one black hole collision every six weeks. And then there was a second data run and a third data run in two pieces. Between the second and the third, there was a very sharp increase in the rate of signals coming in. This is a cumulative number of gra gravitational wave signals or events as a, in as a function of the uh, amount of observing time with LIGO's gravity wave detectors. And so the slope here is indicating the, uh, the rate at which signals are coming in. By the 04 run, our fourth run, which uh, LIGO is in, and Virgo together are in the midst of right now, the, the black hole collisions are being seen once every three days. That's an impressive improvement of a factor of 15 in the event rate. And I do expect it will not be very long until it's one a day uh, signal, but currently once every three days. There have been big improvements in the technology of the gravity wave detectors in the process. And one of the most important of these and most impressive of these is the following. One key to these improvements is quantum measurement technology. This is a new form of 21st century technology that is an experimental side of quantum information science. Quantum information science we normally think of as quantum computing, quantum cryptography, and here it's quantum measurement science. Uh, the key thing is that we are now monitoring the motions in LIGO of 40, we, I should say the experimental team, the young experimenters, not me, but uh, the superb young experimenters working in LIGO and in Virgo. Uh, we're monitoring motions of these 40 kilogram mirrors to a precision that is the level of the quantum fluctuations of the mirror positions. Let me make that more precise. We've, the team has spent hundreds of millions of dollars to isolate the centers of masses uh, of the mirrors from any forces acting on them other than gravitational waves. Uh, the uh, laser beams bouncing off the surfaces of the mirrors are telling us about the motion of the center of mass of the mirrors. And uh, so you can think of each mirror, so far as our measurements are concerned, as being a particle, an individual particle. And we are dealing with four particles, four mirrors. Each is a 40 kilogram particle. Now, if you have an electron or a proton, its position is quite uncertain on atomic scales. It fluctuates randomly. These are called quantum fluctuations, just because of the so-called uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. We are seeing those same fluctuations in the position of 40 kilogram particles. This is macroscopic quantum mechanics. This is quantum mechanics seen on the scale of human beings with a very expensive, a uh, very expensive apparatus that was designed, of course, to begin exploring the warp side of the universe. But as a byproduct, it has been necessary to develop quantum measurement uh, technology at a level that, that we can deal with the fact that the first time we humans see human-sized objects behave quantum mechanically. Vladimir Braginsky, in 1968, a superb experimenter in Moscow, Russia, working in this field, he predicted that this would happen, and he said, we have to start now thinking about how to deal with, how to circumvent these quantum fluctuations, how to circumvent the so-called Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And uh, he coined the phrase quantum non-demolition for the technology you would develop. You wanted to measure the motion of your mirrors and therefore infer the details of the gravitational waves without quantum fluctuations getting in the way, without them demolishing the signal you're looking for. Uh, nowadays, quantum non-demolition is being replaced by the phrase quantum measurement technology. Uh, the key to the current version of quantum measurement technology was devised by a theorist. He was a graduate student of mine, just completing his PhD. His name is Carl Kincaid. Uh, and he had a tremendously important insight in 1981. Uh, 
and his insight was that the key to quantum measurement technology and the key to uh, the fluctuations we're trying to deal with is vacuum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. So if I have here a box and I remove all the electromagnetic waves that I possibly can from the interior, I remove every, all electromagnetic fields from the interior that I can, because of quantum mechanical fluctuations, you're left with a remaining fluctuating electromagnetic field. And these are called vacuum fluctuations. They're the fluctuations that remain when you've made the best vacuum you possibly can. And uh, he realized that the thing that is, uh, we're having to fight in LIGO is the consequences of vacuum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field that enter the interferometer through its output port. Here's the photo detector, that's the laser. Uh, and the key thing is that anything that comes in from the output port has the opposite effect in this arm and that arm. When it fluctuates up in this arm, it's fluctuating down in that arm. And that's what a gravitational wave does. It causes things to fluctuate up in one arm and down in the other arm. And so that's where our noise really comes from, is vacuum fluctuations entering the dark port. Those vacuum fluctuations give rise to three things. A fluctuation, when, after they've gone into the interferometer and then come back out, they beat against the output laser light to produce a randomness in the arrival of photons. So it's called photon shock noise. Uh, in addition, the uh, vacuum fluctuations beat against the laser light in here inside the arms to produce fluctuating radiation pressure that pushes on the mirrors and makes them move randomly. It affects the so-called quantum state of the mirrors. It basically controls the uh, fluctuations of the mirror positions. So what Carl said is, Maybe we can manipulate these vacuum fluctuations in such a way that we can uh, bring them into a form where they don't get in the way of our measurement of gravity waves. And he conceived a way to do this, to use this called squeezing the vacuum. And I'm not going to tell you what squeezing the vacuum is, but you can go read about it on online. But squeezing the vacuum became immediately, it was an idea that had been invented by other people, uh, but it was an idea that was being pursued in a sort of a half-hearted sort of a way by the experimenters. But when they saw Carl's technical paper saying, you can, you can uh, start uh, vacuum, uh, you can start the quantum technology, quantum measurement technology by doing this, suddenly there was a big race uh, uh, of experimental groups against each other to be the first one to uh, squeeze the vacuum. Anyway, so uh, the, there followed then a development of quantum measurement technology over a period of 40 years. Uh, and that was an effort that was initially done outside of the LIGO team and then within the LIGO team and the uh, uh, Virgo team uh, as well. Uh, groups, in, especially in Germany and in Australia and in the US. And that has just come into fruition in the last few years in our 03 run, beginning in 2018, I think it was. Uh, we did a first version of this quantum measurement technology, and in the current run, it's the full up mature version of it. And it is responsible uh, to a fair degree. It's a major uh, contributor to this big improvement in, uh, in the, uh, in, uh, the uh, sensitivity of the detectors and the event rate for collision, for uh, the event rate for gravitational uh, signals coming from black hole collisions. So I want to point out several things here. One is that we, I talked about, I've talked about this uh, sque squeezing the vacuum, manipulating the vacuum fluctuations uh, is being central to technology here. And it's going to occur over the next few minutes in several other techniques uh, in nature as well. Uh, and uh, the second thing is that this really is a multidisciplinary effort. You're bringing in brand new technology developed by a team, a combination of teams of people who are fundamental physicists 
and engineers in a 40-year development in parallel with the mainstream of the uh, gravity wave effort in order to bring it to fruition when it was needed and when it was needed as today. Now, by the late 2030s, successors to LIGO and Virgo, the Einstein telescope, particularly here in Europe and Cosmic Explorer in the US, will likely see gravitational waves 20 times weaker than today. And this is an artist's conception of the uh, Einstein telescope, a triangular array uh, on the border uh, of uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Germany, which is uh, one of two candidate sites for this Einstein telescope and a very, very exciting uh, project. Uh, and with these instruments, we will see every black hole collision in the entire universe, uh, going back to the, uh, birth, the era of the birth of galaxies and stars and black holes with masses less than about 100 solar masses and a variety of other warped side phenomena. And also by the 2030s, we will be seeing gravitational waves coming in from four frequency bands uh, on uh, the millisecond period of oscillations, uh, LIGO, Virgo, and now CAGRA, third gravitational wave detection team, this one in Japan, uh, uh, are now operating. Uh, the first signal was seen in this band in 2015. Uh, LISA, the uh, uh, European Space Agency's space-based gravity wave detector, will be seeing gravitational waves with periods from minutes to hours, uh, and also two, Japanese, two Chinese detectors possibly will come online at roughly the same time. Uh, in uh, pulsar timing arrays, uh, uh, radio telescopes looking at gravitational uh, pulsars, and uh, when the gravitational waves sweep across the Earth, they make the clocks on Earth speed up and slow down, and, uh, and thereby make you think that all the pulsars on the sky are having a speed, slow down and speed up of their pulse, pulses. Uh, and this technique saw its first signal in 2023, gravitational waves, probably from ultra-massive black holes, a superposition to be emission from ultra-massive -black, black hole in spirals and collisions. Uh, seen uh, just a, a little less than a year ago. And then, uh, again, by the uh, 2030s, uh, uh, if not sooner, I expect to see gravitational, primordial gravitational waves from the Big Bang seen indirectly using a technique called CMB polarization. And I won't go into the details, but my basic message is that as has happened in the history of electromagnetic waves, New frequency bands, in that case it was radio waves, gamma rays, uh, and so forth, coming online now relatively quickly over a period of several decades to bring us information radically different in each different frequency band because you're seeing very different sources in each different frequency band. Uh, LISA is seeing, this is then three spacecraft that track each other with laser beams. Uh, sees gravitational waves from giant black holes weighing millions of suns. Uh, it's a tremendously exciting uh, mission. I have used up too much time, so I'm going to skip through, but I had some examples of things that Lisa will see. Uh, and I just want to go on, though, and talk about gravitational waves from the Big Bang, because this is, is, is uh, sort of the holy grail of the future of this field. We uh, are... It is widely believed by theorists that the Big Bang gave rise to vacuum fluctuations of every kind of radiation and particle that can exist in the universe. But nothing but vacuum fluctuations. And that uh, as the universe expanded, these vacuum fluctuations, uh, during an early phase of very rapid expansion called inflation, uh, they converted the vacuum fluctuations into a rich spectrum of real particles and real waves, including real gravitational waves. And those real gravitational waves interacting with a hot plasma in the epoch when, uh, uh, when electromagnetic waves were first able to propagate as the plasma was recombining uh, to become neutral, uh, those gravitational waves induced a polarization signal on the cosmic electromagnetic waves. And that's the cosmic microwave background signal. 
And so the spectrum of this, uh, of the signal that is in the form of a polarization pattern on cosmic electromagnetic waves, that spectrum is a convolution of the influences of inflation and whatever came from the Big Bang, which I suspect may not have been vacuum fluctuations. I don't believe that we are smart enough to be sure that it really is vacuum fluctuations that came off the Big Bang. And so I envision a time, a few decades from now, when we have observations both here uh, and also with ELISA type gravity wave detectors in orbit around the sun, a, a, a constellation of them called the Big Bang Observer. We have observations of gravitational waves from the birth of the universe at two different uh, periods of gravitational waves, periods of a few seconds with this instrument, periods of 100 million years uh, with these, this polarization technique. And I hope, and I think it's quite possible, that what is seen will not be in agreement with what theorists predict when they believe that the universe was born with only vacuum fluctuations. And there will be big surprises. There have been enough big surprises where we were radically wrong during my career of 50 years. Uh, that uh, I'm skeptical when we're this far out on a limb that, we, that the theorists know what they're doing. So I envision the possibility. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Thomas. <laughs> of course, I'm a theorist too. I'm this in, in here with you. But we theorists know that, that when we're wrong, it's a hugely exciting. And so I am looking forward to being wrong and uh, that the combination of the observations and the theoretical efforts will bring us a deep understanding of the laws of quantum gravity that control the birth of the universe and the uh, uh, details of how the universe was born. And so that, I think, is basically where we are going uh, with this in the coming years. Now, I have uh, used up more time than I wanted. I was going to tell you about uh, uh, wormholes and time travel, but maybe I should just stop there. Oh, some people want me to stop, some don't. Okay, I'll, I'll, I will go on for a few minutes more, just, just a few minutes more. <laughs> so uh, it was Herman Weil in 1928, uh, working from a very different point of view than what I'm going to describe, and then Albert Einstein and his young colleague Nathan Rosen in 1935, who imagine that our universe uh, might be bent around like this in the bulk in the higher dimension and that there might be a uh, object called that we call a wor that John Wheeler later named a wormhole it was originally called a Einstein Rosen bridge so a bridge that reaches from our solar system near the uh, the planet Saturn into the uh, core of a distant galaxy. Uh, and remember, remember, it's only the surface that's part of our universe. And so uh, this is a, a two-dimensional analog where I can put a, uh, and this is like a, occurs in the movie Interstellar, uh, in which Eugenie von Tunzelman led a team of uh, artists who made paintings of what might be inside the core of that distant galaxy. I produced the equations for the propagation of light beams, Gaussian light beams, we call them, through the wormhole and up to an IMAX camera. Uh, and Oliver James, the chief uh, scientist at DNAG, the double negative visual effects house in London, uh, programmed the, the, uh, those equations to produce uh, the image that you would see if you were near the one mouth of the wormhole, if you're up here where the camera is looking in, you see this, uh, this spherical ball. It looks like you're looking into a crystal ball and you see images of the, of the core of the galaxy on the other side. Uh, and uh, that was the foundation then for all of the uh, graphics of the wormhole in the movie Interstellar, except for one. <laughs> 
there was one place where artistic license was used. And I'll explain, and th this is instructive. And so, uh, having chosen the parameters for the wormhole to uh, give a visual appearance that Christopher Nolan, the director of the movie, wanted, uh, then uh, the team at Double Negative uh, made a movie of what it looks like to go through the wormhole. And so here we are. Uh, Saturn is very far away. Uh, it's huge. The wormhole is only a few kilometers in size. Uh, but it's bending the light coming from Saturn. So you have one image of Saturn on this side uh, scrunched down into a banana and the other image of Saturn here. And then you're looking into the wormhole. And this is the true trip through the wormhole as produced uh, by solving Einstein's equations. You're entering the wormhole, you're going through it, you're on the other side. Now, when they sent this movie uh, from London to uh, Hollywood, uh, Christopher Nolan saw it, he phoned me and he said, Kip, we got a problem. <laughs> Come over to my house and let's talk about it. So we looked at that movie and several others with other wormhole, uh, uh, wormholes that had different parameters, different shapes and sizes for the wormholes. And they were all dull trips, <laughs> not interesting at all. And he said, so well, now what do we do? And I said, this is the one place where I advocate you use your artistic license, you deviate. And so uh, what you see for the wormhole trip is not this. Every place else in that movie, what you see on the screen is what is predicted by general relativity uh, by propagating light in the vicinity of a black hole or a wormhole. Okay, but this shows you what it means to travel through a wormhole. Now, John Wheeler was very enthusiastic about wormholes in the uh, 1950s and early 1960s, and very unenthusiastic about black holes. And he flipped around about 1962, which is when I went to work with him in Princeton, and became enthusiastic about black holes and lost some of his enthusiasm for wormholes. Now, why lose enthusiasm for wormholes? Well, he realized uh, through research with a student, Robert Fuller, leaning on some work that had been done by a colleague, uh, Martin Kruskal at Princeton, uh, that if you have a photon that is traveling into and through the wormhole, the wormhole will collapse and pinch off before the photon can get through and the photon will get destroyed in the pinch off. You wind up with two singularities on the upper and the lower sheets of the universe. And that this always, if you have a wormhole that uh, has nothing inside it that is distorting the wormhole, no matter of any sort or fields, of any sort, uh, that this will always happen, the pinch off and self-destruction. So in connection with uh, a request from my friend Carl Sagan many years ago, when he was uh, formulating his movie uh, uh, Contact, uh, he wanted his heroine, Jodie Foster, to travel through a black hole to get to the, the vicinity of the Star of Vega. He said, I know I'm in trouble, can you help me? And I said, you use a wormhole instead but it's gotta be a wormhole that doesn't pinch off. And so that's when I started to ask myself, as one or two other of my colleagues had actually asked themselves earlier, it turned out, how do you hold a wormhole open? You have to fill it with what I would call exotic matter, matter that repels gravitationally, which means it has negative mass in a certain technical sense. And, uh, and so this kind of exotic matter, in fact, it turns out, can be made in the laboratory, it is made in the laboratory, and in fact, it's made by manipulating vacuum fluctuations. And in fact, the squeezing of the vacuum that I talked about is the technology that we are now using in LIGO is the key to uh, LIGO's current and future. That produces exotic matter. As the squeezed vacuum evolves, it oscillates between having positive mass and negative mass in a squeezed vacuum. And uh, so exotic matter really does exist. It also exists in what is called the Casimir vacuum. Uh, these are technical phrases that will mean something to a few of the physicists. Uh, but it's very hard and perhaps impossible to make large amounts of this exotic matter. 
uh, when you're just, the only thing you can do is work with vacuum fluctuations. There are limitations on how much you can do. So the bottom line today is, can wormholes occur naturally in the universe? After several decades of research, the answer is almost certainly no, except uh, so-called quantum foam, which was conceived of by John Wheeler and a source of his enthusiasm. These are fluctuations of the topology of space and time on scales of so-called Planck length, which I won't go into the details of, but these are associated with these poorly understood laws of quantum gravity, so we're getting back into that. Uh, and uh, this quantum foam on very, very light microscopic scales may well exist, uh, in fact. Uh, can uh, big wormholes that you could travel through be made by an advanced civilization? Well, the only way I can imagine it is you reach down into the quantum foam and you enlarge one of these, uh, one of these wormholes, turning it, making it real and enlarge it. That's the kind of thing I will discuss only over several glasses of whiskey. <laughs> Beer is not enough, uh, because it's so far beyond our capability of analyzing uh, as theorists today. Can wormholes be held open? Probably not. The, there's a, uh, been a lot of effort over the last uh, 30 years to figure out whether you can get enough uh, exotic matter by manipulating vacuum fluctuation to hold a worm a big wormhole open, human-sized wormhole open? The answer is very probably not. But when speculating beyond the frontiers of firm knowledge, I've been proved wrong many times, sometimes spectacularly. So you shouldn't take my pronouncements too seriously. But that, this is where things currently stand. Finally, uh, once I had begun to think about wormholes and holding them open, uh, I realized, together with two students in 1988, Mike Morris and Ulvi Yurtseber, that uh, if I gave one wormhole mouth to my wife, and I kept the other mouth back here on Earth, uh, and uh, she got into a rocket ship and traveled out nearly the speed of light and turned around and came back. There's something called the twins paradox, which guarantees that she will age far less than I do. So she might come back uh, after a year as seen by her, and it may have been 50 years as seen by me, and I'm really much older than I'm likely to ever live. Uh, but she comes back and is seen through the external universe. Uh, I am very old. She sees me very old. However, uh, and this is her coming back and sees me then very old. Uh, looking through space, Carolee sees me old. But looking through the wormhole, we can hold hands, each with our wristwatches, and look inside the wormhole, and time will flow at the same rate uh, down there inside the wormhole as seen uh, uh, from the two sides. So as seen, sorry, I can knock this off. I'm coming to the last few minutes. Can you put this back on me, Thomas? You know how. Oh, okay. So as, as seen through the wormhole, uh, I, I have not aged any more than she has, but as seen through space, I'm very old. That means, obviously, that if I go around very old me, and I go through the wormhole and come back, uh, I will meet the much younger me uh, coming back. So the wormhole has become a time machine for going backward in time. Now in 1991, having realized this, I began to ask a question together with Sung Won Kim, and Stephen Hawking was asking the same kind of question together with some of his students at about the same time, uh, that made us suspect that maybe at the moment that it is created, any time machine may self-destruct. And the key thing is that as she's moving back toward Earth, uh, there's a first moment when it's possible uh, to uh, go into the wormhole, use the wormhole as a time machine, and return at the moment when you started out. And so if you have something that uh, goes through the interior of the wormhole from here to there, then comes out and travels at the speed of light back, there's a first moment when it gets back and uh, winds up 
uh, at the same place as it started at the same time as it started. The very first moment when going out in space through the wormhole, you can time travel. And the first thing that can do that then would be light, something traveling at the speed of light, but also vacuum fluctuations. I can shield light out. I cannot shield out ultra high energy vacuum fluctuations. And the ultra high energy vacuum fluctuations, which inevitably are there, will go traveling through the wormhole and they will pile up on themselves in space and in time so that after one trip, I have twice as much as I began with, another trip I have four times as much as I began with, and so forth, and exponentially it grows, and would appear to cause an exponential growth in the amount of energy in these vacuum fluctuations, and as a result, uh, so much gravity from the energy, this exponentiating energy, that it would cause the, uh, it would destroy the wormhole. On the other hand, uh, as Stephen pointed out to me, uh, just at the po point when you think it's destroying the wormhole, uh, the laws of physics we're using to do the calculation break down and the laws of quantum gravity intervene. So it's the laws of quantum gravity that control the end point of this explosion, inevitably. And so the laws of quantum gravity control the birth of the universe, they control what goes on inside black holes, they appear to control the fate of time machines. If you have the ultimate uh, future technology. And so I really want you and your young colleagues, Thomas, to figure out those laws of quantum gravity before I die. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, I, sorry, I didn't say the final uh, punchline, that Stephen Hawking, uh, is always willing to go out farther out on a limb than I am. And so when we were doing this uh, research independently of each other, he promulgated what he called the chronology protection conjecture, which is a conjecture that all time machines, no matter how they are made by, no matter how advanced a civilization, will always self-destruct at the moment you try to turn them on, thereby keeping the a universe safe for historians of any species. <laughs> well, conclusions. When I was a student, there were a lot of speculations about the warped side of the universe. Today, 62 years later, we've observed black holes. We've observed gravitational waves. We have a lot of observational information about the Big Bang. We doubt that wormholes exist and that backward time travel is possible, but we're going uh, out on a limb and saying that, but that's, that's where the best uh, information is. In the future, gravitational waves will reveal enormous amount of additional detail about the warp side of the universe. Thank you. technology in gravitational waves, but how does work? That, that means that at, at what speed like um, like gravitational waves uh, disperse? It's at the speed of light. And second is, what do you mean like by the whole universe? Do you mean like the whole observable universe or yeah. just the whole universe? Yeah. So, so first, there is an issue of how fast gravitational waves travel. If you think about it, I told you about the, the neutron star collision. In that neutron star collision, the first electromagnetic waves arrived 1.7 seconds after 
the gravitational waves that came from the collision itself. So they were traveling at almost the same speed, not pretty, it's pretty clear. And 1.7 seconds is a good estimate for how long it took this fireball to expand enough that the gamma rays could get out. So that's the reason for the delay. So we have very strong proof that they're propagating at the same speed to a ac fractional accuracy of 1.7 seconds divided by how long the whole trip was, which was a few hundred million years. I think it's, uh, I forget, maybe 150 million years or something like that. And uh, so, uh, so electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves are predicted to propagate at the same speed and to enormous accuracy, we have seen that they propagate at the same speed. Now that means that uh, when we're looking out in distance in the, through the universe, we are looking backward in time. And we look back to the time when the first black holes formed and we think we know when that was. Uh, it was back when uh, the universe, I, I can't, it's at the redshift for those who think in that language, back in a redshift of perhaps 20 or so, 10, 20, 30, but uh, somewhere in there. And when I say that to uh, see, all, the, uh, see all, all black hole mergers uh, uh, with masses less than about 100 solar masses, uh, that means, uh, that assumes that the first black hole mergers were back in this epoch, uh, roughly when the universe was a billion years old, roughly, instead of the 13 billion years old. And uh, so, and, but, the gravitational waves when uh, two uh, 100 solar mass uh, black holes collide uh, are shifted uh, to longer wavelengths by the expansion of the universe. And so when I place the limit on of, of 100 solar masses, that is also determined in part by the sh shifting in the wavelength of the, those gravitational waves. And uh, something heavier than about 100 solar masses we probably wouldn't see because it shifted to too long a wavelength for the cosmic explorer. And so, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Nice lecture. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. There, yeah, second. Hello, and there seems to be a paradox. So. When neutron stars merge, we get gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves. Do we also get electromagnetic waves from black, black hole merger? Or, oh, and if not, why? So, so uh, to get to electromagnetic get... waves, you need to have electrical charges that are accelerating. And if you just have two black holes merging, the black holes are made not from matter, they're made from warp space and time, and there's no electric charge involved. On the other hand, if you have gas around the black holes, then you'll get some emission from the gas being disturbed by the black hole collision. The question is whether you have enough emission then uh, to, be able to, to be able to see it uh, with uh, current generations of, of, uh, of electromagnetic telescopes. And the answer is not really. I mean, so with every, with every black hole collision, the electromagnetic astronomy community searches very hard looking for a signal because if they can find a signal associated with that collision. We know there was matter around those colliding black holes and being disturbed by the black hole collision. And that's an opportunity to learn about how matter behaves in the immediate vicinity of black holes. So it'd be very exciting to see it but it has to depend on uh, matter being there in the vicinity of those black holes and being uh, enough matter, uh, enough strongly dis disturbed to produce a strong electromagnetic signal. Uh, uh, but if you just have pure black hole collisions, no electromagnetic waves whatsoever. But you don't need net charge. Uh, you, don't, you don't need net charge necessarily. I mean, uh, you have, uh, for example, you have emission from atoms when uh, the electron moves from one quantum state to another inside an atom, zero net charge, but uh, the change in the distribution of the charge is enough. And, yeah. 
Okay, maybe one last question. Does someone dare to ask something about Interstellar? <laughs> <laughs> I can't really see. I, I, I think there's a question uh, over there. Must have been very, very clear. Everybody <laughs> understood everything. <laughs> All the way up there is a question. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is, we've seen how electromagnetic waves has improved our lives as a society with x-rays in the medicine world, in telecommunications. What is your perspective that we can use the gravitational waves as a tool for whatever you think in engineering or in our society? So, 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 so the question is, is then, then, can, just as we use electromagnetic waves for uh, modern technology, what are the prospects to use gravitational waves for a very advanced technology? Yeah. And uh, I, I think the problem is that uh, it, we are now at a point where we can barely detect, well not barely, where we can detect gravitational waves but only from very massive objects colliding with each other. Uh, we don't have the capability to generate gravitational waves in a laboratory and detect the gravitational waves. So we don't have control of the sources. The universe has control of the sources. And that means that we, uh, that, uh, that then severely limits our possibilities. I think the bottom line is that uh, we need a technology of some centuries from now before we can start thinking about using gravitational waves for any kind of technology. Um, and, uh, but on the other hand, as I think I've indicated, uh, the very process of trying to, gener to, to design and construct gravitational wave detectors is leading to major advances in technology, but it's major advances in electromagnetic technology uh, that is associated with uh, uh, solving the problem of vacuum fluctuations getting in the way of uh, our uh, gravitational wave observations. So uh, it really, this, this enterprise has in a number of ways influenced uh, uh, technology, but not via gravitational waves themselves. Uh, let me give you a second example besides the, the uh, quantum measurement technology I talked about is very sophisticated and very exciting for the future. But another thing that we had to do, that the engineers had to do, uh, working together with the physicists, was develop cheap vacuum pipes to hold the laser beams going back and forth so the laser beams would not be disturbed by gas in the, that uh, they passed through inside the uh, those four kilometers between mirrors. And the trouble is that the way to produce vacuum pipes cheaply, it also leads to having a lot of hydrogen in the, uh, in the metal that is used for the vacuum pipes. And so there was an effort made jointly between LIGO and uh, the steel industry to develop methods of producing steel that has very little hydrogen in the interiors of the steel walls of vacuum pipes. Now that's kind of science also a little esoteric and a little dull, but it has had important applications in, in other areas. But it's an example of this multidisciplinarity that uh, you talked about in introducing this, that uh, the, uh, the breakthroughs that have had to be made in the gravitational wave effort have influenced technology of steel production, as well as uh, quantum measurement technology and many other things in between. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank thank you. It seems to me that you are a multidisciplinary institute just on your own. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a fantastic group of multidisciplinary <laughs> colleagues, uh, all of them much younger than I am. Almost all of them much younger than I am. Let's thank you again.
Lovely. Wonderful.